Hi everybody, it's Kelly from The Hub here today talking with our friend Angela from CAP in the uh, D uh, Domestic Violence Program. Angela, my friend, how are you? Good. It's Wednesday. It is. It's, it's, it it's is. a short week, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Wednesday already. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the day we tape. We don't air this on Wednesday, but it's totally fine. We are, we're all friends. We know how this stuff works. Um, just like last week, um, Angela brought a friend with her again this week, uh, who is also from CAP, um, and we're going to learn about a different aspect of uh, domestic violence. So Angela, please introduce us to your friend. So I brought my boss with me today. Always um, good to bring your boss. <laughs> She's also a great friend. <laughs> um, Christine Gilfillan is the director for Domestic Violence Services of Lancaster. And um, she has been doing this work for more than 20 years as well here in Lancaster and also in Berks County. And today we're talking about economic abuse and the impacts of, um, of, of economics and interfering with a person's ability to to have an income and also on the community. I have some statistics that I'll share with you. Um, but Christine is here to help us with this conversation. Welcome, Christine. Welcome to our, our, our time that we have with Angela that we very much appreciate. So thank you for letting her you know, help us with that as well. So we've been talking about all different aspects of domestic violence and I gotta say, I'm not sure there are a lot of people out there who are thinking to themselves, you know, they haven't talked about economic issues and we really gotta get to that. That's generally not high on the priority list when, when we talk about this stuff. So why, why is it important to pull this out separately and talk about it like this? And hello to your cat who just hopped up. <laughs> that this is, is why that Ricky or Lucy. That's right. Because right, your cat's like, hello, I am very important yes. in all conversations. This is, this is why this is my favorite thing in the whole planet. Because not only do we know all of everybody's children and house set up, and we also know their pets. So hello, little feline. <laughs> Ricky. <laughs> Hello, Ricky. So, so why is this like, like economic stuff so important? Why? Who cares? Well, first of all, thanks for having me and hello. And um, I was just thinking about the fact that it's both a, a way that people are abused. So it's, it's a tactic or a strategy that abusive individuals use to control their partners. If you can control the money and the finances and the access to the resources, that's, that's a level of control, right? That really impacts people's lives. And it's also a, a part of the fallout of abuse as well. So it's something that, it's both a tactic that's used and it's part of the fallout that occurs. So the main reason why, and I don't have all the statistics in front of me like Angela does, but the main reason why survivors have few choices is not only their emotional involvement and investment in the relationship, but also because economically they have very few choices when it comes to how to end that relationship or exit from it safely. So it's pretty big. I mean, it might be the thing that we wouldn't think to talk about first, but I really have to believe that when it comes down to it, it's a major factor in the ways that people are able to make decisions to, to be empowered to move on. You would have to be financially stable or financially empowered as well. And I think that that's in addition to the trauma and the emotional impact of abuse and, and the physical impacts that's the issue that we're working to help most people with, especially the people who come into our safe house. How does it, how does it work as it, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. How you want to, you were going to ask how it works as a tactic? Yeah. How does it work as a tactic? Like, well, um, got some questions. Yeah. So deliberately sabotaging your partner's abilities to work or earn money or, engage in education, attain another educational level, take a training program. So abusers, whether they've 
deliberately thought this out or whether it's just something they do instinctively <laughs> for control, I'm not sure, but they will deliberately limit access to financial resources, educational resources to keep that person dependent upon them. And it works, it works quite well if they're the one earning the money, especially or earning more money, which, you know, if you're talking about a male abuser and a female victim, it works in other scenarios as well, but especially right. in that scenario where we know it's not equal or, and, or if women are primarily tasked with caring for children, their economic, you know, world sort of narrows during that time. So that's very effective for the abuser to use economic strategies. I don't have to hit you necessarily. Right, right. Um, but I can limit your economic choices and I can sabotage your, your attempts to be employed. I can do all kinds of things that will keep you dependent upon me and keep you in my control. So it's, it's very effective. And I think up to 90 some percent of victims experience this type of abuse. It's, it's overwhelming. And then the, and then the fallout as well, in terms of, even if you are able to make the decision to leave, what options do you have economically to succeed on your own? So a good yeah, thing. They, they also, um, just to throw out their credit history, they have access, presumably, to the victim's identifying information, and they can screw with their credit and destroy it. I mean, they just, we've, you know, between Bridge House and our clients at the legal clinic, we hear anecdotally stories about this all of the time, where the abuser it will open up a credit card um, in the victim's name um, and then run it up and, and just all kinds of things, especially when it comes to credit history. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about somebody who's trying to get a house or an apartment on their own, that's one of the things they're looking at, right? It's credit history. Right. That's are, a perfect, are, and that's a perfect example of something that's a strategy. So sometimes that's done deliberately as a strategy. And even if it's not done deliberately as a strategy, it's <coughs> often part of the fallout anyway, even if that person hadn't, planned that it's often what happens as a result of the control in these relationships so that's a perfect example and if your credit now more than ever if your credit history is destroyed if your score credit score is destroyed you are you have very little access to things we do hear those stories every day people unable to maybe they have the income to rent an apartment but their credit score is is in terrible shape because of what's happened Hmm. And we've talked about this in several different ways that if you are not in the middle of this yourself, you have learned how this works through TV shows and movies. And so that's why the majority, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, right all those other things that tv doesn't talk about that can affect you much more deeply than and it's not like you, once your credit score is ruined you can wave a wand or deposit money and then fix your credit score that's something that takes a long time to fix mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's yeah, I mean, that's why we're launching an economic advocacy, a, a more formalized economic advocacy effort, hiring a staff person who is dedicated to this work and who can work with other community resources because we need them all, right? We need banks, we need credit unions, we need credit coaches, credit repair entities. We need to sort of gather a group of those folks all around who can say, we understand that through no fault of their own, people are in this situation and we need to be able to help them or they're going to be in danger again because they're going to end up having to go back or, so, or having to live with someone else that they're dependent upon. Yeah, what, so what Christine is speaking to, I think, is this community approach. And she mentioned early on, like, economics is a barrier. I, I'm, 
in my mind, I'm thinking it's probably the number one reason why people don't leave, but I can't find the statistic to back that up. But doing this work for a long time, and I see Christine shaking her head yes, trust mm -hmm. us that it's, it's one of the top barriers. <laughs> Um, think about it. Like you have to be able to support yourself and your children, if you have them, to be able to to start some a life of freedom, right? Minus all of the other stuff that the abuser is going to do to hold you back or hold you down or keep you from being independent. We as a community also need to step forward. And this is part of why I wanted Christine to join us today because she's also a community thinker, um, big picture thinker. Here are some of the statistics that I wanted to share, which tie into this community aspect of it. Um, so nearly two in three corporate executives, 63%, say that domestic violence is a major problem in our society, and more than 55% cite its harmful impact on productivity in their companies. And then on the converse of that, Nearly more than 70% of United States workplaces do not have a formal program policy that addresses workplace violence. Um, nearly 8 million days of paid work each year is lost due to domestic violence issues. That's the equivalent of more than 32,000 full-time jobs. And 96% of domestic violence victims who are employed experience problems at work due to abuse. So there are things that we can do as a community and as workplaces to better support victims and people who are trying to live independently. We need to be like, what are the things that people need? They need living wage jobs. They need transportation infrastructure to get to those jobs. They need affordable childcare and childcare that will also work for shift work because some of the, you know, some of these folks are working factory or shift work jobs. Right. Yeah, so this is a parallel issue that directly connects to what we're talking about, looking at domestic violence and how it impacts the workplace. And I guess what we can say is, if you're not moved by the fact that people are being um, treated poorly or, or marginalized, you may be moved as a workplace, a large workplace, by the fact, by the loss of productivity figures. So it's whatever you have to sort of approach all approach it from all of those angles. We want you to care about your employees and care about other human beings and about their lives. And then we're also going to let you know the impact that this is having on the workplace and on the community so that you maybe we can sort of justify the investment that we need to make in order to mitigate this problem. So addressing workplaces and, and even workplaces that have violence policies don't have specific policies around domestic violence because it's different when the perpetrator mm -hmm. is the person's partner or former partner than it is sort of just a blanket workplace violence policy which could address all different kinds of things too so it would be a key component so yeah. if there are employers watching who want who the light bulb just went on. How can they, like, can they reach out to say, look, I, it never crossed my mind. Yes, it was a, yes, it has been a problem. And yes, I've thought about it, but I didn't know how to create a solution for this. Mm -hmm. So if they want to create a solution, can they reach out to you guys to be, or are there other resources for them to be able to go, huh, now I know what I need to do so that we can make this better in our workplace. Yeah, there are actually lots of resources out there. There are lots of large companies and networks of companies that have directly addressed this issue and become very proactive on this issue. So there are sample policies, there are trainings that can occur for management and also for all staff in workplaces. Um, Absolutely, the resources are out there and we can work with companies, we can help them make the connections. And then we would also wanna help them make the connections to services right. because in order for the company to address the problem, they have, it's sort of like the healthcare system addressing the problem. They have to know exactly what is available out there in terms of resources and help and how to make those referrals. Otherwise, it's gonna be one of those topics that 
people are reluctant to talk about because if I open that box, then what do I do? So how do our HR teams get trained and get the information they need? And then how do they make the connections to the local domestic violence programs so that they know what the resources are that are out there? Yeah, right, because it's all well and good to like, let's make a policy that will solve the problems. And that just means that that's another there's some more ink on a piece of paper somewhere that sits in a drawer, right? There, it's, this is about creating all of it to be able to help. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, this didn't cross my mind to have this be a thing that affects the work environment this much. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely, I mean, especially when you think about all of the businesses that are in Lancaster County, um, there's, there's just a, a huge myriad of programs. Um, and, and there are some um, agencies, some businesses that are really trying to reach out to folks who may have, ha may have not had those opportunities. So up in your area, Four Seasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so they started a pilot program this year um, where they're actually providing transportation um, to their workers. There's, Christine, remind me, I think it's specifically um, women, like women heads of households that they were reaching out to earlier this year. And then they're like, they work Monday through Friday. Um, so I, they help with childcare or they do it specifically so that they have easier access to childcare. And then I want to say like Fridays is a training day or some kind of educational component. Do you remember that, Christine? I don't remember. We should get the information about the specific program, but they're running a program. I guess the greatest barrier to folks working there from, who live maybe in the city or around the city is transportation. Yeah, absolutely. So the key thing they did was provide transportation. And then also some life skills or right, um, yeah. organizational skills around just all kinds of issues in terms of being employed and maintaining childcare and doing all of those things. Is that a largely, is force, would Four Seasons be a largely male workforce regularly or a female workforce? Because we all, when in the work that I did in Berks County, we would approach large employers differently depending on whether their workforce was primarily, for example, health systems, their workforce is primarily female. Right. Uh, so we would, there was sort of a different approach, but we also had up there um, East Penn Manufacturing it was in the Northern part of the County and their workforce was overwhelmingly male. So it was kind of a different approach um, to, the, to the issue and to looking at their policies and how they responded. So it can be that tailored too, in terms of looking at where that workplace is coming from in terms of who works there. Right, because that can make a huge difference in how your work, how your, how you approach creating solutions for that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, at East Penn, they would have, there would be people who were perpetrate, who were known perpetrators, say with a PFA against them, and in some cases, their partner also worked. Absolutely. At East, it was so huge that so there were all kinds of. Um, things that needed to be addressed there in their policies. And one of the things was what happens if we have a, a, perp a known perpetrator working here? How do we sort of navigate that and deal with that too? Kelly, are you familiar with that program at Four Seasons? Um, I am as of three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't know. I know that you do a lot of this work too. Like yeah. our, our work is parallel. Absolutely. You're working with people who have specific needs as well. I think, um, so I did tour four seasons as part of leadership Lancaster and they are, it looked like they were mostly, um, predominantly a male workforce. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if they gave us specific numbers on that or not. Um, because in the warehouse, they, I mean, they're zooming around there on, you know, move on those, on things that move the, the produce around and thing like, things like that. And then they're they have a large um, trucker force also, mm -hmm. the drivers. 
um, who I think are mostly male. It was quite an operation for sure. Um, and so, you know, there's also that opportunity, like having um, non-traditional fields where women would be in, where you would find women in that, in that workforce or in that business, bringing them in because sometimes those are the higher paying jobs, right? Mm -hmm. We know that women are still making something like 72 cents on the dollar compared to men. There's a, a meme going around like for the gender reveals, put 72 cents in the envelope or a dollar and that tells you what you're gonna get. Um, I don't know if you saw that recently or not, but um, you know, so we, we still have, you know, we can take this out to the stratosphere as we start looking at the different levels of where change can occur to better support victims because that's really what we're trying to do is remove the barriers that keep women trapped or keep victims trapped in in these relationships yep. yeah and i you know in our in our part of the county four seasons is a real pillar of the community and employ a huge amount of people not only in our area but you're right all around the county and so to be able to use them as an example of how you can create change is very very helpful and and that doesn't mean that smaller companies don't have those same kinds of opportunities it's just different because you're smaller so i don't want a uh, you know a traditional sort of mom and pop place to think, well, I can't do that at four seasons. No, 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 no. You can do those same kinds of things. It's just different. It's just tailored to make it work for you differently. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that this now provides a lot of information for people, for viewers who are watching this to be able to say, huh, I didn't really know it worked like that. And now I can create solutions so that it doesn't work like that any longer. So that's why, that's why this series is so helpful. Every single episode. <laughs> In our area of outreach would be landlords and property management yeah. companies for them to, we've made contact with several who have worked closely with us and who have a better understanding of the barriers that some of the survivors we're working with face in terms of securing housing. But um, I think a more organized effort there would help as well. Some survivors have evictions on their yep. records that were through no fault of their own. Their circumstances have changed now, but because it's there, it makes it very difficult. So probably like an, an economic advocacy task force or a we pictured sort of a community task force where we would have representatives from some of the different sectors come to the table and you know we would do some education and also hear what their challenges are because right it's very challenging to rent to people who aren't able to be successful in that rental unit or you know understanding where they're coming from and just helping them to know that some of the programs we have can assist people for several months with support or even with financial support so that they might be able to feel more secure in terms of renting to a survivor. I'm so impressed of all the work that you guys have done, but you're right. The more we talk about this, the more work we have to do. <laughs> and, that's, and that's a good thing to be able to bring to bring this this uh, education, absolutely. absolutely. So yeah, I think that creating creating a task force to be able to work on those those uh, economic issues is uh, is very important. This is wonderful, yeah. Angela. As always, yes, times <laughs> a million and a half. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today and your your uh, expertise in this. We will talk again next week about another issue. Can I do my spiel? Oh, of course. We have to end with <laughs> the text and the, the, the text number and the, and the phone number. Absolutely. Thank you. So I am also going to put an extra layer out there today, an extra call out. If you are somebody in the community who is interested in this economic advocacy work, we would love to hear from you. 
um, you know, maybe you're somebody who does the credit repair like Christine was talking about or a business who wants to learn more about supporting your employees um, or a landlord who wants to, you know, work with us to better support the clients we serve. Um, there's lots of ways that you can contact us. Um, you can see Christine's name there and her email address is on our website. You can also contact us through the CAP info page. Um, you can um, also call the 24 hour hotline, um, but we have a business line as well. 299, so 717-299-9677 is a business line and there's a directory there that you can find us. Our 24 hour hotline for victims and survivors and significant others looking for services is 717-299-1249. And we do have the text line. You can text the word SAFE to 61222, that's three twos. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can connect with us. If you're somebody who wants to be part of this work or you're somebody um, who might benefit from our services and our support, we're here for, for everyone in the community. Thank you to both of you very much. We will talk again soon. All right. Have yeah. a good